Hey, what's going on YouTube? My name is Alex Lugo and today we are finally going to talk about Rust. Rust is, first of all, a pain in the butt. But really though, Rust is actually one of the languages I am the most excited for getting into on this channel. A quick little introduction to Rust, it's a low level but a bit more high level than C-ish sort of systems programming language. It's really good for concurrency and it is supposedly completely memory safe, although there is not yet a paper proving it. But for all intents and purposes, I'm just going to call it memory safe. In terms of syntax, Rust is somewhere between Python and C, I would say. It definitely has a lot more low level control over Python. You would compile it as you would C using either the Rust compiler or you can use the cargo build system which actually employs the Rust-C compiler in its runtime. And the cool thing about Cargo is it also serves as its package manager as well. So you would compile Rust, so it's a lot like C code, except that there are three things that keep Rust memory safe and thread safe, where C lacks in those departments. And these are sort of foreign concepts if you haven't seen them explicitly like you will in Rust. So the three things are ownership, borrowing, and lifetimes. Those are sort of the three things that really keep Rust programs memory safe, and I will get into those a bit more as I actually show you an example of some Rust code. So let's say in C, you have one function that returns a reference to some data. So that data is somewhere out in memory, but you don't know exactly where yet. That's fine, because you have a reference to it. You call another function on that reference, but little do you know, that function actually frees the data at the reference. So now, the reference is sort of unusable but there's nothing stopping you from calling a third method on that reference, which now points to nothing. And that gets you a seg fault or some sort of undefined behavior, which is really bad because that's usually how hackers, I guess, hack your shit. But with Rust, however, the compiler actually keeps track of what function or what context holds what data at any given point. So it can tell at compile time whether or not you could potentially run into a scenario like that where you free a reference and then your function doesn't have anything to get called on. And this is what makes Rust basically memory safe, is that it keeps track of the ownership so that way only a certain context can access certain data. But it still allows you to return references from functions, and that's borrowing. In Rust, basically what it says is the function that's getting this does not have full ownership over the object. It can only mess around with the object or even read the object for a limited amount of time. And then once that method is done, the original method that gave it a borrow regains full ownership and can continue running again. Now what goes hand in hand with those two features is called lifetimes. So let's say you return a reference to an object from a function in Rust. The thing about Rust is that whenever a context ends, when you get to that end curly bracket, it takes all of the data that that context had ownership of and it just deallocates it. So you don't have to run a garbage collector in Rust, it's not run automatically, but you don't have to free data manually. It's this really cool sweet spot in between where it's very precise garbage collection. I mean, I would even call it garbage collection. It's very precise deallocation of memory, but you don't have to do it manually. Like the compiler will just take care of it for you and that's really cool. But the thing is, if you want to return a reference to an object that's supposed to stay in memory past the function that actually returns it, then you need to let Rust know somehow that that object should not be garbage collected immediately after exiting out of the function. That's where lifetimes comes in. The concept looks a little wonky when you actually put it into Rust code, but after you kind of get used to it, you kind of just forget it's there and you're like, oh yeah, lifetimes, you know, it's like really nice. So now that I've sort of explained those three big features, let's actually start looking at some code. Okay, I'm going to start off with a very simple hello world program and then eventually I'm going to put in the build system cargo into my Rust code so that way you guys can see how you make like a cargo.toml file and compile using Rust C and cargo. So we're gonna go ahead and create this and we're gonna say fn main because that is the main function here in Rust. Main.rs. All right, and this is gonna return a unit type. So in C or Java, you have void, but in other, in other languages like Rust or OCaml, you have unit. 
which is basically just this empty curly brackets. Okay, and we're gonna say print line, hello world. All right, so that's all we're really gonna do here. So let's actually open up a terminal and compile this thing. Okay, so dot slash main, hello world. That's pretty simple, right? But let's actually see what happens when we want to return it from another function. Okay, so we're getting a couple little errors here. And some of the reason for this is that string is actually a atomic type. So we have to tell it either how long the string is going to be, or what we can do is actually give it a reference to it, denoted by this little ampersand here. So we're actually just going to do that. All right, so we're going to turn a reference to the string. That's no problem, right? Let's just make sure we have a reference here and try compiling it again. And we still get an error. Let's see why. Well, for one, first we have to interpolate it here. This is how you do string interpolation in Rust. It's pretty nice, actually. And this is telling us to give it a lifetime. So that's exactly what I was talking about before, where you create some string here and you want to return the reference to it. But once you get to this point here, all the data that this function has ownership of is going to get deleted automatically. So it can't survive this function long enough to get put into our message variable right here. So we're going to want to give this function a lifetime. So to give it a lifetime, you say just tick A or whatever sort of lifetime you want to give it. Yeah, we'll put it like that. And then the reference has a lifetime of tick A. And that's really all you have to do. It's actually really simple in Rust. It looks weird. It's confusing at first, but it is so simple. Just use tick A if you have to return a reference. And that's mostly it for like beginner Rust courses. And let's go ahead and interpolate this and compile again. Okay, dot slash main says hello world, but that looks exactly like it did for the other program. So we're gonna say hello, Alex. And then I don't know why I put my last name. That's kind of awkward. <laughs> there we go. Okay, so living proof that I have returned a reference to a string in Rust with a lifetime and I interpolate it into this message here. But let's actually get some lifetimes put into this real quick and maybe even some loops. Okay, so I'm going to say times, some function times. And I want to return a i32. So a 32-bit integer, that's fine. I'm gonna return 15. No, five. Actually, you don't have to put return in Rust. So the last value in a context like this is going to be its return type. It's sort of similar to an OCaml. Rust, I would say, is a bit higher level than C, but it's designed for the same level that you would program C programs in. But it also has some functional elements like Contexts are sort of similar to closures, and it has pattern matching. So times is just going to return five. So we're going to say let t equal times here. And make sure you put a semicolon here, just separating each command. So since we have three commands, we only really need these two semicolons. You don't need one after this last command here. So we're going to say times, and then for i in zero to t, we're gonna print it. So this will print this out five times. Okay, so we don't actually use the value t in here, so that's why it's giving us a little warning, but you know, I really don't care about warning. So let's continue. Yeah, so it says hello five times right here. But let's say we don't wanna know how many times it actually prints out hello for us. So I'm going to show all of you how to use a crate, more specifically the random generation crate. 
and then we're going to compile that with cargo. All right, so first of all, I want to generate a cargo crate. So we're gonna run cargo init right here, and there we go. So if we ls, we'll see we have a new file here called cargo.toml. So cargo is the build system and package manager for Rust. So it's like a two-in-one deal. Now, cargo packages are called crates, which is why I kept saying the word crate here. Oh, and even made this little git ignore and a .git folder. How thoughtful. So cargo.toml here is basically your Rust version of like package.json or your Dune file or I guess maybe not a Dune file, but you know, it's, it's your package manager file. So this tells us like the name, the path, and everything else we want to use for this Rust program. And also gives dependencies. So I'm going to import the rand crate here because we want to get random numbers going. So in times here, or even before that, we want to say extern crate rand. So this is going to import the random crate into our code. All right, an i32. So this will now return us a random integer of 32 bits. So let's go ahead and run that. We're going to cargo build. And there we go. We have a unexpected token because I was stupid and I forgot to add a semicolon. There we go. So dot slash main, and we still have five of these. Isn't that interesting? That's because we have to run cargo run. Okay, so I made a few changes in that I assured that it would print out at least three times. I bounded it to maximum eight times by this, and I got rid of that one warning because warnings do irritate me a bit. So this is basically what you get when you put all that together you get a hello message some random times between like three and eight. Isn't that nice? Okay, hopefully you all found this video helpful. If you did, please like, share, comment, subscribe, follow me on social media, and don't forget to click that little notification bell so that way you get notified whenever I update a new video. If you are new here, you should definitely subscribe because I'll be doing a lot more Rust, OCaml, Lua, all sorts of weird other language videos in the near future. Trust me, I have a whole lot of video ideas to put on this channel. It's going to be good. Apart from that, I don't have too much else to say. So thank you all so much for watching. And I will see you guys next time.